Our management were very much like, we think you have a chance of knocking Beyonce off the number one slot. And we were like, you're kidding. And I was brought up in a very safe middle class background. And so something like football felt really, felt real, felt more real than the life I was um, living. We only announced this week that Will Ferrell has just become an owner, uh, a minority owner in the club as well. That's good. A comedian putting money into Leeds, that makes sense. They're the best team in the league on their day, but it's all about on their day, isn't it? Tim, thank you so much for coming on Football Music and Me. Um, they're quite often, when you say to somebody, how are you, it's a very standard greeting. But given your recent album has gone to number one this month, but your beloved Leeds United have missed that on automatic promotion, has this tested your famous zen-like powers of keeping on a level? <laughs> uh, uh... I, I basically compartmentalised Leeds United into some back of my mind where I don't think about it. It's too distressing otherwise. Um, but I could do that. I can just go push it to the back of the mind. And then while I'm watching them, when they started failing, my mind was going, well, they'll just get hammered if they play like this in the Premier League, so what's the point? They shouldn't They shouldn't be there. You know? Don't be so fatalistic. Well, I, I mean it in a good way, in, in that they have to learn from this. You know, there's some good players in that team, but they need a, a stronger core of old heads um, who, who know how to play in the Premier mm. League, or they won't, they'll be back down like the three who are coming back down from the Premier League right now. I don't want to skip over the fact that Yummy went to number one. What's, Yummy what's... went to number one. Our record went to number one. We We... We've had a number one with a compilation before, but never with a studio album. So after 41 years, that's that's not bad. And not bad? Well, that's an understatement. That's all right. There's there's no higher number, is there? I, I mean, it, we I grew up on bands that weren't necessarily very successful. Uh, Velvet Underground only sold 20,000 copies of their albums whilst they were going. Iggy Pop at the time was not that well known. Patty Smith, the same. She, they all became more famous later. So numbers weren't that important to us. We were very, a bit anti-fame. You know, we avoided the enemy, for example. We refused, we were the only band in the history of the enemy who turned down a front cover. When we did a photo, photo our first, first shoot with Kevin Cummins, the famous photographer, we all turned our heads away because we didn't want our faces to be seen. Um, That's the antithesis of most bands. It was insane. It was we were very austere, and we believed that every band should be judged by how good they are live. Live would be the litmus test of authenticity. So we didn't really mind about selling records. It didn't matter to us. So when we became successful after seven years of just plowing our own field and the live gigs getting bigger and bigger and bigger. By the time we, we got played on radio in Britain, we were playing two nights at Manchester, 10,000 a night, um, and we were a hot ticket. But we did it on our own, and we did it on our own terms. Mm. So when the media came, we were a bit like, oh, it will come, and it will go. And we knew it would go again. You know, We knew there'd be tides of appreciation. Um, and so we've always had that attitude, or I have certainly, to success in that you know it's quite transient. Um, and we'd be on top of the pops. We'd do a few TV shows. I'd go to Ikea, and I'd suddenly be signing 14 autographs. But within a year, I'd go to Ikea, and nobody recognized me. Mm. So it was kind of like, ah, oh, this is kind of like... It's fickle, fine. Oh, I, do, I wouldn't call it fickle. I just call it, it's superficial. And it didn't, so it was never something we fully aspired to. Um, so the number one is lovely and we can see the kudos it gives us in the public eye and in the music business eye and the, the, the media which has not really 
come to James for years because we're considered too old. Um, as simple as that, really. Oh, yeah, if we were a young band, oh, my God, they'd be all over us. And if we were cute, they'd be all over us. Um, but, you know, youth and beauty have some strong privileges that age doesn't. And um, and so we we kind of go, oh, great, number one, that's... Was it a surprise at all? Yes, and um, we could see our management were very much like, we think you have a chance of knocking Beyonce off the number one slot. And we were like, you're kidding. Um, and they said, yeah, just do a few signings and do this and talk to the fans. And we did. And the fans just were like, they kind of, our fans went, we're going to get them to number one, I think was what happened really. And so we got a lot of support from people who, who made sure that they bought in the first week, essentially, which is what you do. It's a bit of a game, you know, in some ways. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic outlook to have, you know, as you say, that kind of never too high, never too low, treat it what it is. But even though you are able to compartmentalise, are you able to say, in all your years of watching and supporting Leeds United, you've never got too high and you've never got too low. Is football different? Is it is it the one thing that tests your famous level-headedness? Yeah, I guess it, it probably is. Uh, I mean, the difference between football and music, first of all, I'll say, is that you can't really lose in music. There's not half the stadium groaning and half the, st you know, three quarters of the stadium cheering and half the rest in agony. It, 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 there's victors and losers in football. There isn't in music. If you make a great concert, nearly everyone walks out happy. Um, that's the benefit of being a musician. Um, so I, and I don't see number one, number two. We've had loads of number twos. We've had loads of number threes. I don't see that as any less. Sit Down was number two for weeks. Um, and a song which... The per I'm the one and only was number one, and that sweet singer of that of that song said, "I wish we weren't number one. James should be number one," which was the kindest, humble thing to say. Um, Chesney Hawks, Chesney that was yeah, very sweet, yeah, lovely guy, clearly. Um, and so with football, okay, um, yeah, well, what I find is. I pretend it doesn't matter as much to me. And when I watch the games and we're playing badly, I find myself doing other things to distract myself from the fact that we're playing badly. So, you know, it's pretty hard to be zen about football, I think. I think it's impossible. <laughs> yeah. So t take, me, take me right back to the start. Why Leeds? I know you were born in Yorkshire. Was there ever a chance of it being anybody else? No. I was taken to see Don Revis Leeds United when I was probably seven or eight. Walked into this stadium of lights and green, pristine grass. Even then, I think, maybe a false memory. And you're hearing thousands of men singing. <clears throat> and where do you hear thousands of men singing? It was just like, what is this? <clears throat> it felt magical to me. Um, and then... Of course, with that Leeds United team, when you went, you didn't see them lose very often. No. So you had a false sense of security. <laughs> <laughs> Little did you know. <laughs> Little did I know. Um, and then by about 11, I was going on the cot. I was being sent with an older boy to look after me, poor soul, um, and standing shoulder to shoulder with your feet off the ground most of the time because you were so crammed in there. And every time Leeds scored a goal, you go down six flights without touching the ground, and then you come back up six flights of stairs, uh, and it was kind of thrilling, um, a little dangerous, very. Um, but and I couldn't, I probably couldn't see that much because I was eleven. But it's the thrill of it, isn't it? It's the thrill of it, completely. Who? I mean, that, they had so many fabulous players at the time. But were there any from that era that you particularly liked? Norman Hunter, uh, 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 Terry Cooper. Mm -hmm. um, Terry Cooper was kind of, kind of, before he broke his leg, was fairly unplayable down that wing as a, as a fullback. 
um just brilliant getting down there beating his man crossing it norman hunter for his kind of stability in the center you could just see this guy you didn't mess with him hold up um he wasn't that big but he was fearsome in the tackle um I was naive. I didn't realize how Leeds were a, di a dirty team. I think they would be considered now. Uh, and obviously, in retrospect, everyone calls them dirty Leeds. Um, but as a kid, I didn't see it. I saw Jack Charlton as kind of like, ooh, all arms, elbows, and knees in a way that didn't look right to a kid. But the rest of them, I just saw as tough. Um, and, you know, they had obviously... Eddie Gray, who was sublime, uh, and Lorimer, who could pack a shot like no one else in that in that time. Um, so it was a joy, really. Were you, uh, you know, as you say, it was the whole atmosphere, the ground. I mean, the all-white kit, mm -hmm. which was Revy's idea, was fantastic. And do you remember the numbers on the socks, the, yeah, the yeah. tags as well? Did you have a shirt? Did you have a kit at all? Yeah, yeah, I had a shirt. I had a scarf, uh, which nearly got nicked. By some kids who were going to come and steal it from me, um, <laughs> you know, it, there was a, it, Leeds was a tough ground to go to, and there was, you know, you saw fighting. If we played Sheffield, I went to a Sheffield away, United game away, Wednesday game away, and I remember seeing, you know, hordes of Leeds fans getting into the Sheffield area and full on fight starting. Um, but again, as a kid, that was quite exciting to witness. Um, somewhat romanticised, I think. Yeah. I and I was brought up in a very safe, middle-class background. And so something like football felt really, felt real. Felt more real than the life I was um, living, which was much more about appearances and, and how you are meant to behave. And then here was, oh, this is how people behave. The escapism of going where you could, you know, shout and swear at, at the crowd. Absolutely. So, hurl abuse. And a singer. Yeah. You know, church, I was taken to church every week and a few people would drone these awful hymns. Um, but I'm with Nietzsche who said something like, you'll have to get better songs if you want me to join your religion. Yeah. Um, and the good songs are at football matches. They were more interesting ones, the more spontaneous ones, the ones that um, connected to the events on the field. Oh, the, the, the chance. Yeah. Chance was fantastic at football. I mean, I Le Leeds have got stuck with marching on together, which yeah. is somewhat tedious. Uh, you know, we need we need some more songwriters at Leeds to, to come up with some more interesting songs. Can't they come out to one of yours? Absolutely, if they want to. Um, but but I'm talking about songs that, like, are fun. Like the Man City chant to Man United when they won the league for the first time. You know, you thought you were the champions, you're not, you're not. You know, we we stole it in Fergie time. You know, it's, like, brilliant, brilliant. When when they when they go back and forth, the fans are fantastic. I recently went to uh, Luton against Nottingham Forest. And the Nottingham Forest... Fans, it was a draw, started seeing at the end. Going down, going down, going down. Immediately the Luton fans going bust, going bust. bust. <laughs> when it's got a bit of humour to it, yeah. It's great. Yeah, especially in the moment, as you say, when you see it improvised in front of you, it's really that's alive. You're successful in your own right, and Leeds United is over here. And then this happens when you start mm. a uh, a friendship and i would have to say certainly knowing the other party and this is meant hugely respectfully <laughs> a most unlikely friendship oh, really with with the title <laughs> captain gordon strachan when just just was on the phone to him 10 minutes ago did you tell him you were coming in here no i didn't um he'll know uh soon enough um how did it happen how did you become friends? So I was going regular. I was in Manchester and going regularly to Leeds, um, and getting tickets. And they were, you know, they they knew I was coming. I guess the box office, etc., knew who I was. We had laid album out, and one week there was a note from Gordon saying 
would you come and be my guest? I'd love to see you afterwards. I really love your record. Um, so I, I went and met him. We got on really well instantly. And, and then he'd invite, he, he'd keep inviting me to games and I go, can I wear a dress? And he'd go, no, no, don't wear the dress. <laughs> um, from, cause I was on the front cover of laid, I wore yes. a dress. And I always thought I'd play with that. And I always wanted to go to a football match wearing a dress and see what response I got. Uh, I, I once actually, this is a slight diverging statement. Gordon got me tickets to see Leeds West Ham at West Ham. <clears throat> and I, I knew the actor who was in a TV show called Queer as Folk, which was a, at the time a revolutionary queer drama. Channel we, 4, wasn't it? Yeah, Channel yeah. 4. But it was out there, you know, lots mm. of sex scenes, totally like taboo, breaking all the boundaries. And I said, do you want to come to the West Ham game? And he was like, no, I'll be terrified. Someone might recognize me and I'll, I'll get the crap kicked out of me. I said, no, you won't. He said, I said, I'll wear a dress if it makes you feel better. And he was like, no, don't wear a dress. So I took him to the game and, I, and we're in the Leeds end. And at half time we go to get some food. And this huge supporter comes up to us and he points at my mate and he goes, you, you're that actor, aren't you? And he goes, yeah. He goes, you're in that show. Queer as folk, aren't you? And he goes, yes. He goes, me and me girlfriend, love you. <laughs> and, uh, and that was what I, you know, that's the reality of yeah. actually what the fear was. I mean, as you say, I mean, football is very macho, so um, less so now, less so now, but it certainly was back in the day. So I can understand Gordon being slightly concerned about you turning up in a dress at the time. Yeah. I mean, I, I you know, I am actually unfortunately heterosexual, but I, I like to, at the time, to kind of challenge things a bit and leave people guessing and um including my parents um because that was you said it famously in life mess around with gender roles mess around with gender roles um and it just felt like that shouldn't be important to people and we should change how how we're seen you know and and sexually and now you can see it's become a massive issue in the culture wars um uh, and is is still being questioned and fought against, but I think it's straightforward, really. You became friendly with Gordon. They just won the title, hadn't they, under Howard Wilkinson? Yes. And Gordon was the captain yes. of the next great lead side. Yes. How much did you enjoy and were you able to follow that title win? A lot. I, I came to a lot of those games. Um, you know, I watched I watched nearly all Cantona's games for Leeds. Um, and, um, I watched most of those games. I missed the the final game I was in Germany or, or you know, whenever I'm touring, I can't obviously do it. And we often play at weekends, which is a, a of, of Of that particular era, who did you like as a player? Uh, Gary Speed. Ah. Yeah. Uh, Rod Wallace. Um, uh, Gordon. Yeah. Gordon, Gordon was the best to me. He was, you never saw him have a bad game, ever. And he drove that team. Like, he made them all play better than they were, I think, by his kind of passion and his intelligence. And just, it was just watching that in football intelligence of not playing the obvious pass or not doing the obvious that he did every week in, week out. And you could just see this. Gordon has an ethic to him of honesty that uh, uh, has always made him someone that I deeply admire. We, you know, we stayed close when he became manager of Coventry, when he moved to Southampton, I'd go to those games. Um, and he was always honest in a way that even if you didn't like him, you could see other football fans respected him for that. <clears throat> and he was great with fans. Like, he taught me something about that. Once he, before he was the manager of Celtic, he uh, flew me up to watch Celtic Rangers because I think the Rangers manager was a big fan of James. So we flew up. Was it Walter? Walter Smith at the time? No, no. It was, was a big music man. It was uh, 
the guy who came from Everton, I can't his name. When we were walking around, where would it have been? Edinburgh? Yeah, Edinburgh, I think. Glasgow. W- would it? The final would have been in Glasgow. Oh, it'd have been Hamden, wouldn't it? Hamden, yeah. We were walking around Glasgow and every person in Glasgow wanted to talk to Gordon. It was like from seven-year-olds to 80-year-olds. And he was just so graceful with everybody and so polite. And it was it was really just how he handled those situations was a really good lesson um, of elegance, really. He's, he's called as a very principled person. Really isn't principled, he? yeah. Yeah. We, we finally got... Um, we couldn't get to the game. All the taxis were booked. So we hitched a lift and this van of Celtic supporters picked up me and Gordon Strachan and and we were in the back and they're singing songs and they're just loving Gordon at the time and giving it and then they drop us off you know they go through police roadblocks going we got Gordon Strachan in the back and we go through you know, get right to the yeah get right to the ground yeah. basically and get dropped off it was a really wild evening and then we're then they put us I think just behind the substitutes bench and because of the nature of those games, there were no fans allowed in that area. There was like a no man's land that only me and Gordon were in, in the whole ground. To the right, it was green and white, and to the left, it was blue. And it was it was so segregated and so everybody was in their tribal colours. And it, it was one of the most passionate games I've ever seen. Uh, it was wild, wild game. Um and you know, and then I used to fly up for the Celtic games and watch quite a few of those. You know, I, the Scottish support is m- much more passionate than anything I'd seen in England. We haven't touched on. By the way, can I take this off? I'm, I'm starting to sweat. <laughs> or will it mess up your continuity? No, you can do what you want. I'm gonna go chit shit on the bin. The guests, the guests make the rules in this place. <laughs> um, the one thing we haven't touched on, um, knowing Gordon and and what the culture would have been like at that time. That's why I don't think I was being uh, insensitive. Bearing in mind, you were on the front cover of an album in a dress. Mm. It was potentially an unlikely friendship. Yeah. Um, we 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 had a, a break. I think one of our breakthrough nights, I was staying with him. I used to go and stay with him when he was in managing Southampton. And he'd lost that day and we went to a comedy club in the evening because he was so depressed and it was like cheering up. <laughs> Poor comedian. <laughs> yeah. Poor bloke. And it was fine and we went home and we neither of us really drink at all. No, Gordon famously teetotal. And somehow we got a bottle of champagne out and we started drinking and Leslie's wife kept putting the champagne in the fridge and unknown to us opening a new bottle and we... We realised at about two in the morning that we'd gone through about three or four bottles of champagne. And we realised this when I had to go out into the garden to relieve my contents of my stomach on the flower beds. And I I couldn't leave the next day. I was too sick. And he he was sick for about four days. (laughs) We were both in a state... And, but it kind of bonded us because these two people who didn't drink had, you know, once every two years I drink. And then this was, we hadn't realized that these new bottles were being sneaked out onto the table. And it, it wrecked us for a little while. But it it, it 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 took us deeper into our friendship. This is one of the moments, definitely. Well, I, I would imagine that, you know, it is in any field, if you can talk to somebody close to you, who is in a completely different field to you, but obviously you know you know your football. And if it was a football thing, you would have a view on it, but from a different perspective. Would you ever talk football at all? Would you ever see oh, yeah. opinion on football? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And he'd educate me on you know what just happened, and and what was going on with different players, and um, yeah, he'd t- and he'd tell me all kinds of things. <laughs> just, I, str- I have his shirt from the year he won the league with Leeds and he only had two away shirts and he gave me one of his away shirts signed by the whole team. It's one of my prized possessions, you know. I'm not surprised. Yeah. Leeds United captain. Yeah, and he only had two he only had two. Uh he gave one to me. It was like a big deal. You you say about um 
you know, what can you ask a manager when they've just lost a game? I remember Gordon said somewhere once about me. He said, you've just lost a game. You've got to go and do the interviews. You don't want to do it. You don't really want to talk about it. And there's Jeff with his microphone, like the father of doom with his sigh, the spectre of death. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Gordon. Thanks. 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 Yeah. 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 Thanks a lot for that. Yeah, yeah I was I was going to uh, ask you about um, as well as the ups and downs of the team and the team's fortunes leads. Of course, we've seen ups and downs in terms of the owners mm. of Leeds. Mm. What's that been like? And, and also, <laughs> the, we only announced this week that Will Ferrell has just become an owner, a, a minority owner in the club as well. Is this because you passed up the chance to buy into Leeds? Oh, I wish I had the money. Um, right, okay, I didn't know he had. That's good. A comedian putting money into Leeds, that makes sense. Um, I knew uh, Alan Layton mm-hmm. heard, he was he he appointed Peter Ridsdale and he heard I was a Leeds fan and he was a fan of James. So he used to take me to games for a while. And I was quite a lot behind the scenes. You know, I'd have meals with Peter Ridsdale and meet David O'Leary. And and I was really watching what's going on behind the scenes, going, how are they affording this? And, and, and also the players that got away that probably would have made all the difference, actually. I know that we nearly got Frank Lampard. Um, and I, Ridsdale said to me, they're asking for 11 million. It's ridiculous for a player of that calibre. And it was like, mm, didn't turn out that way. And they nearly got John Arnorisa before Liverpool. And apparently the deal was done. And then they asked for an extra million. And it, it pissed off the Leeds hierarchy so much they didn't go the extra million. And that would have replaced Ian Hart at the time, who became, God bless him, brilliant free kick taker, but a little bit slow. Um, yeah. And people ended up targeting Leeds through Ian Hart. Um and so it was also like, you know, you, you'd you hear about those moments where you go, what a team that would have been if they'd managed to get those two players, for example. It's hard, the what-ifs. But it was it was so, I mean, if you were close to it, you'd have seen the money being spent. It, it, you're thinking, where's this money come from? Yeah. And to get to two semifinals, major European competition, mm. and they were playing fantastic football. Fantastic football. But and they might literally the bubble burst. Well, I mean, the bubble burst because Liverpool got one more point and Leeds didn't go to Europe. Mm. And Gary McAllister s- scored for Liverpool uh, at that point in time, ironically. Um, and yeah, and then the bubble burst. And then we were one of the first teams to get really hit with financial, you know, points against. Yeah. Down into the next division, down into the next division. Which again... You know, you look at that, you look at the penalties imposed on clubs. Why aren't those penalties imposed in the year in which they commit those crimes? So, and why aren't the trophies given back? You know, like if a if a athlete in the Olympics is caught doping and they kind of had the medals taken away from them, as yes. I understand. Yep, instant. So what's going on with that? I, and I don't want to alienate. I love watching City. I, I don't want to like it's. Be the honestly, guy. I don't think anybody could give you a straight answer. You know, why did uh, Everton get deducted ten points? Then it's reduced. Why did Forest? Why with and, four points? Why, and why not last season when uh, f- uh, so that the teams who went down? I don't know. Were not then Leeds were one of those teams. I don't, I don't think it would have benefited Leeds. I think there was a team above them. Um, but well, it, Leicester City, they're talking about them starting with the points deductions. And why Why is that not coming now this I season? I don't know those answers. You know, because that might benefit Leeds. Tim, I only ask questions and they're not very good ones. So <laughs> I certainly haven't got any answers. <laughs> what, what do you think football has kind of given you in your, in your life? You've had a fantastic career. You've pursued all of the things that interest you. Music, dance, acting. <laughs> Alongside of that, where, where does where does football kind of mm-hmm. fit in? I know you're able to compartmentalise, but what's it given you? Would you say? I, I think to me, it's a 
slightly guilty secret. And I mean, I'm not secretive about it, but I have a little bit of guilt watching football, especially neutral games. Um, I like I force myself now to go on a treadmill and watch football because then I feel like at least I'm doing something productive while I'm watching football. Um, but it's 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 those moments of watching a group of players be in the zone, being what I would call almost, you know, I, I, I dance to get into trance states. When I go on stage, I sing and dance to get into trance states. Because in that state, you're connected to something bigger than yourself. And I think football at its best does that with players and fans, where you're connected to something bigger than yourself. And it doesn't matter what you're doing doesn't matter that these men are just kicking a ball around. If they get in the zone, you watch something that can take your breath away. You know you're watching something pretty magical. And so it, it would, you wouldn't matter what sport that is. I mean, I think the word zone came originally from basketball. And my kid got me into basketball in the last few years. I've been really enjoying that because the teams are more evenly balanced because they have a draft system, yep. as we talked about. Um, but it's watching those moments of physical magic, either individual magic, which almost remind me of, say, when I first saw Bruce Lee, and you go, how do you do that? How is someone doing that? Or when you first see Messi skin a mouse in its sleep, and you go, how did he get around those players? What's he doing? How can they not knock him off the ball? And uh, And those moments of individual magic or the moments of group team magic where a team play almost supernaturally where they're passing without looking and they know where each other are and they do some no look pass or some astonishing move that no one anticipated um it's those moments of magic that you watch i think any sport for to be honest um and then there's then there's the songs i'm a singer there's the, there's the songs. You know, I wish there was a, an ability on the TV to be able to turn up the crowd over the commentators sometimes and be able to just choose, you know, who you wanted to listen to at various points so you can hear what's, what the noise is in... in Because often they're turned down so quiet and you're being told by the commentators what an amazing atmosphere is in the ground, but you can't actually hear it. I mean, no. And it, it bugs me. It's nothing like being there. We all, we all say... Watching at home is the second best seat in the house. We'll give you all the angles, all the coverage, but you can be it. Nothing beats being at a game. Yeah, because right? you, you feel that adrenaline, you feel that community, you feel that passion, um, and it's it's amazing when it's positive. Um, when it, does it feel any different when you play a football stadium as opposed to playing a, a concert hall? No. Um, it's, do, you, do you ever go to any stadium and think, "Wow, this is the home of such and such team"? Not really. Or is, it, is it just a venue? It's a venue, it, it, and it's whether the venue has good acoustics, whether you can reach the, the audience. Some venues have better sight lines. Some venues, you know, I often go off stage and get in the audience, and some venues are easier to, to do that than others. And um, so it's more about that. I think. All right, if we were playing the new camp there might be a like oh, we're playing the new camp um there might be a moment of that um but um you know probably more than ellen road i love ellen road obviously but it's not not a pretty venue to look at in raw though is it wait yeah it's you, raw you don't actually want it to change do you <clears throat> um no i wouldn't want it to change and it would be amazing playing ellen road of course it would but as I say, you know, I've been to many different grounds in my time. I, I like going to watch good games of football. So I, I've seen Arsenal. I, I've seen all kinds of games. Lastly, how hopeful are you for the playoffs? Start off with Norwich, Daniel Farker's old team. Um, since the international break, Leeds have been playing really badly. They They were destroying all comers before the international break and they had a fluency to their play that was beautiful to watch playing the right kind of football attacking football 
since the playoffs, I don't know, <laughs> wheels come off the wagon. Um, <clears throat> it, it so is going to depend on whether they, you know, Jorginho hasn't been the same player since his hernia operation. And he, he's a key for us for unlocking defences. Um, and Somerville hasn't quite been the same player. Um, we've lost Daniel James to an injury. I don't know. I'm I'm wanting to be hopeful. I mean, anything can happen. Obviously, they're a great. They're at their best. They're a great team, but they have to get that unity back, and they have to get their energy back. They they look like there's not much in the tank. So I'm I'm hoping the adrenaline in the playoffs will bring that back to them. You just you just worry, don't you, that having led the table, have been right up there for so long, to then fall away. You might it might be harder to lift yourself for the playoffs, and that defense looked so rock solid at Leeds. They don't look rock solid at the moment. Um, so it's whether the manager can can fire them up again to have one more push, and it's whether they've got it in their legs. I think, um, and uh, I'll be watching, uh, uh, and it it it's. I'm sure every Leeds fan is like, oh no. Because I think quite often the team that comes third doesn't get through. Um, it's one of the other teams that have sneaked into the... Yeah, but records are made to be broken. Records are made to be broken. They've got it in... The team is the best team. They beat Leicester and Ipswich away and home and they're the best team in the league on their day. But it's all about on their day, isn't it? Brilliant. Tim, thank you so much. Thank you. I really enjoyed listening to you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.